Hello again, my name is Eric. Thanks for checking into ET2 Media. I'm an amateur trail runner and I also make films. In particular, we made a film called 50 and it's a documentary about a first 50 miler and it was the first 50 miler for me, first and only one I've ever done. I am training for a 50K run and the Squamish 5050. So Louise Blay is with us for a couple of segments. We're gonna break this one into three parts. And the first part coming up, we're going to talk nutrition for ultras. Louise is a human kinetics professor. And Louise, welcome first of all. You should probably tell us what that means. I teach human kinetics at Okanagan College. So our students, it's a two-year diploma program where 80% of our students go on to finish their kinesiology degree at UBCO. And I teach a variety of courses within that program. Nutrition is one of them, strength and conditioning, fitness testing and exercise prescription, uh, and sports psychology. So kind of Excellent. a jack of all trades. The number of comments I've had from people who are in their late 40s, early 50s and beyond, and they're just taking up long distance trail running ultras, nutrition is vital. How do we fuel our body for training? Great question. So first, you need to understand that the energy system that is fueling your run uh, is energized by carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are the number one fuel source for moderate to high intensity exercise. And it's going to be paramount that you deliver enough carbohydrate, that you start your training runs, that you start your event uh, topped up, what we'll say. So your muscles store carbohydrate. We only have two places in the body we store it, the liver and the muscles. It's called glycogen in that form. So you want your muscles to be fully uh, topped up with carbohydrate before you even start one of these. And then you want to also be able to consume carbohydrate during. So interestingly, your body wants to use what we call endogenous carbohydrates. So the carbohydrates that are stored in your muscle before it wants to use exogenous or the carbohydrates that we consume during the event. Now, it's good that you do consume though, because we wanna make sure that we don't ever actually run out, right? That's a bonk when you hear about people doing a marathon and they hit a wall, all they did is they ran out of carbohydrate. It doesn't mean they have to stop what they're doing, but it means they have to fuel their exercise with fat. And as soon as that happens, you have to lower your intensity. So you are no longer running at your optimal speed. You're not gonna win that thing running on fat. So it is important that you get enough carbohydrate for sure. Now you mentioned a really interesting thing, which was that your stomach started to rebel. And, and this is definitely what we see uh, happen while people are exercising. So running has the, you know, it, 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 your stomach is jostling up and down as you're running. It, it actually is the sport that has the highest amount of gastrointestinal distress associated with it. So we do have to be careful. And, and most athletes are really wise to actually train their gut as well as their bodies, right? So whatever you um, use during training becomes absolutely what you use during your event if it worked for you and you didn't get to stress from it. So you wanna keep your carbohydrates more bland, more simple, less fiber. Um, we actually want what's called a carbohydrate blend. So you wanna find foods that have a combination of glucose and fructose because they use two different transporters to get into your system. And that way you're not clogging one of those transporters. So performance has been, it's been shown to be enhanced as well as the transport of the carbohydrate into the muscle is enhanced when we combine or have these carbohydrate blends. So starting, um, you know, so if we, if we just talk about the event or the training run, my expectation for an athlete would be that they had full muscles, so fully synthesized um, glycogen. So they're already topped up. And it's interesting because you mentioned the 50-50 in Squamish, and I have a really important tip for you that I'm going to pass on, but not yet. Um, so you want to start with your muscles full of glycogen, and then you want to consume the average that it appears in the literature seems to be appropriate is, uh, and it is based on how many hours you're going to exercise, is about 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Now, technically, if you're going to exercise more than three hours, that should even go up to 90 grams. 
but that's only cyclists seem to be able to tolerate that much food. Uh, again, they're sitting on a bike, so they have different um, a different effect when they're eating and digesting and transporting that than runners do. So runners seem to be, uh, they fare a little bit better in that slightly lower carbohydrate, 30 to 60. And so that translates to about 120 to 320 calories per hour. And so that can come in any form that you have learned during your training runs works for you. So it might be bananas, it might be gels, uh, it might be drinks. You can get it, you know, something like a, I mean, I don't recommend carb, uh, Gatorade, but that is a carbohydrate based drink. Um, and so for some people, they tolerate that really well. Uh, you see often Coke being used during these events, usually um, flat Coke, right? So the bubbles have dissipated and there's a couple of benefits of that. Caffeine is, is a, an important ergogenic aid that most athletes should take advantage of if they can tolerate caffeine because it does a couple of really important things. It actually um, allows your body or encourages your body to use the carbs you're eating during the event or drinking during the event and saves some of the carbohydrates that are stored in your muscles so you'll last longer, right? So you'd actually, for your 50 mile event, you couldn't store enough carbohydrate to last that entire duration. Uh, if, if you hadn't been eating during that event, you, you wouldn't have been able to last and keep running. You would have had to keep, you would have had to start walking and finish as a hike instead of a run. So um, yeah, so you're looking at trying to consume about 300 calories an hour during that event and starting like almost right away. So certainly not right away, but within that first hour, even though you might feel like, oh, I just, you know, I had something to eat and I feel pretty good. Um, you, you don't want to wait an hour and then have to put twice as much in your body in the next hour because you're trying not to make your stomach cranky. So um, yeah, so gels, like when we, you know, people, often want to use real food, which is great if you can do it, right? So you had aid stations, or if you have aid stations, you can leave real food at an aid station so that it can be there. It might be a wrap with avocado and bacon or something in it. it, it having something that's palatable and sometimes a little bit salty is really important, especially if your event is long. So your brain actually starts to reject sugary foods, uh, especially if they're similar. So if you you know, if you think you're going to have the exact same thing over and over and over and over again, you're going to get to a point six to eight hours in where your brain is going to say, no, I'm not, I, I can't eat this, but your body might be saying, shut up. I really need some food. Right. Um, and so you, you want to make sure that it's enjoyable. This is, this is not, I mean, it's funny because I teach nutrition. This is not when we worry about nutrition, right? We're not looking for micronutrients. We're not looking for anything to be healthy. We're really just trying to sustain activity and increase performance. And if that's jube jubes and you feel like eating jube jubes, then jube jubes it is. So, um, you know, that's, that's really our key motivation and, and objective. Uh, for sure is, is getting that carbohydrate in um, regularly and making sure the brain agrees with it as well. Can you tell me why it's so important to fuel and train your body to consume that food that you're going to need in the run? Why is it so important during the training, which for some of these runs, training could go six to eight months, several months of training. What kind of food are you eating and, and why is it so important? Okay, so you, you, you're gonna to wanna to eat a, a, a meal two to three hours before your training event or training run, training session. Um, and again, you find something that your body finds relatively easy to digest. So oatmeal is usually a wonderful thing. Uh, toast can be a wonderful thing. Yogurt, if you're good with yogurt and dairy and that sort of thing um, will work. Um, you want it to be almost completely carbohydrate with a little bit of protein or fat. So that actually helps us create uh, glycogen to have that, but it also helps to, you know, sustain us and, uh, 
makes the food more palatable and sometimes can make it easier to digest. So you're going to, you know, practice and train with, you know, you're going to take, you know, you're going to write things down. I'm a really firm believer in recording and debriefing, right? So you write down how much oatmeal you ate, if you put peanut butter in it, whatever. And then how was it? So what's absolutely key, and we'll talk about later with mental skills, is something called your rating of perceived exertion. How are you feeling during this run, right? Do you feel like you have enough energy? Do you feel strong? And certainly, is your stomach upset? And if you can tick all of those boxes, right? I feel strong, I feel like I have energy and my stomach isn't upset, then that food is a winner for sure. So that gets, you know, you put that aside, you've written that down, you're like, okay, this is a great breakfast for me before I do a training run or a great lunch. Um, and, and that could be a, it could end up being one of your snacks during your event too, right? I mean, it's not impossible to have oatmeal ready for you if that's something that you tolerate. So. It's important to record and then you will take the foods that you're going to try on your training run. So it might be a banana one day. It might be a wrap with uh, peanut butter and banana or, um, you know, some avocado or gels, like whatever you are choosing. Fig Newtons usually work really, really well, too. They're pretty um, small and transportable and um, like so easy to put in your pocket, but they're they have lots of calories, which is fantastic, right? Because if you have to carry it, so your training runs do differ from the event in that you either have to carry it or you have to stash it somewhere, right? So I know I know people who will go out for a long run and they'll go out ahead of time and they'll stash water bottles and they'll stash food, obviously hoping nobody finds them in the trails and, you know, takes them, but um but you're, you're going to want something easy. So usually you're looking at stuff that can go in your pockets. And so gels and fig newtons and sometimes even just little chocolate bars, right? Something like that. Uh, like post Halloween runs <laughs> tend to have all those little chocolate bars. Uh, and again, you'll record. What did you try? And so you're actually best when you're training to figure out what works for you. It's actually not very during one run, right? So use if you're going to use bananas, try to use just bananas. And then once you've determined bananas work, then you can start mixing something in with those bananas. So maybe you'll have a banana and then you'll have a gel or a fig newton. And when you figure out that that works, then you get to add to that list. And that's when you actually get to start adding more variety. Uh, to the foods that you're consuming during the event, but it, you, you're going to have to keep a diary and you're just going to have to pay attention and not, you know, I think where people get into trouble sometimes is they sign up for a race and the race organizers have a drink or, you know, they have sponsored product that that person may not have ever used before. And it's tempting because it looks delicious and it's different, right? You get tired of the same old things, but if the event is important to you, and some people have more sensitive stomachs, other people can probably get away with it, but some people won't be able to, and that can completely derail that race for them. So we, when we train, we're training ourselves to fuel for the run itself, for the, the event we're training for, but we're also training our body. Like we're, we have to fuel our body for the training too, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. a big part of it. Yeah. So those same rules apply. You still need that 30 to 60, probably closer to 60 grams of carbohydrates. So around 320 calories from carbohydrate uh, per hour. Absolutely. And so one of the things that's absolutely key when you're training is that you, as soon as your training run ends, you I, I don't want to use the words must, but when, so I've competed, uh, I've never done ultra trail running, but I've done ultra cycling. So I've done the Trans Rockies and the Trans Alps, which were seven or eight day races that, you know, we were on the bike anywhere from four to eight hours a day. And I carried on my body, right? Because you have to, as a cyclist, that's what you had to do, my recovery food which meant the minute I crossed that finish line, I consumed, I had uh, special gels that were a little bit higher in protein and I consumed them immediately after I crossed the finish line because it, I might've finished at anywhere from two to 5 p.m. I was gonna be back on the start line again at 8 a.m. We know that it takes at best 
24 hours to replenish muscle glycogen. So the, the muscle, the glycogen or the carbohydrates that are stored in your muscle, you're going to use them during your training run or during your event. And if you need to use those muscles again, so certainly when you're training, you're training multiple days in a row, right? In fact, that's one of the, the key aspects of training for an ultra is training in a fatigued state on tired legs, which means you had to do something the day before. Um, but, but you're not training on depleted legs. That's, that's a difference. So as soon as you finish your training run, you need to think about getting carbohydrates. And usually we're looking at about a four to one ratio. So four, say grams of carbohydrate to one gram of protein, and that will maximize your body's ability to replenish that carbohydrate in your muscle. But there's one other thing that you can do, which is, uh, um, I think it's pretty cool because I like coffee, but another benefit of caffeine is it accelerates glycogen resynthesis. So if you consume that post uh, training run or post event carbohydrate with caffeine, so a cappuccino would be a lovely thing to have at the end of every training ride, maybe every training ride should end at a cafe, uh, you will actually resynthesize up to a third faster uh, which is pretty massive. So that was the tip I was going to give you for your 50-50 event in Squamish. You won't have 24 hours. You'll have done an 80K run, which I'm guessing you're going to finish around 10 p.m. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. If and all then, goes well, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So best case scenario. And then you're going to be back on the start line without even like forget 24 hours to replenish glycogen, you've got eight or nine hours to replenish yeah. glycogen. It's not going to happen. You're not going to optimally top up your muscles. Mm -hmm. So here's the drag though. You're going to finish at 10 PM. Are you going to want to consume caffeine when you have to go to bed because you got to get up? Yes. Probably. Yes. I okay. I'm okay it with that. Good for you. <laughs> that is amazing because <laughs> a lot of people couldn't and sleep, but if you can, all the power to you, that is going to be a huge benefit to you. So even though you might finish that 80K and feel kind of, you know, your stomach's probably not going to feel great and you're probably not going to be hoping to sit down to a prime rib dinner or something like this, you're really going to have to do your best to have, again, this is where anything that is super palatable to you, right? So your favorite food in the entire world, uh, make sure that you have that ready for you to consume so that while you're sleeping, you can uh, get as much carbohydrate stored for the next day as possible. You're also going to have to do the best job you've ever done consuming carbohydrates during your event, during that particular ADK, because what you consume on that first day is sparing you for the next day. Do you get the sense from the people you're speaking with, people who are not competing necessarily, but who are involved in different long runs or, or cycling events that they know a lot of this, that they've done their research to the point where this science is what, how they keep going in these events or that they just kind of wing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I think for the sense that I get, then I get asked to speak a lot around nutrition for performance. Um, so the sense I get is that um, people don't understand and we live in a funny world, right? So right now, a lot of people don't like carbohydrates. They uh, I, I've, coached people in cycling who have told me they're on the keto diet. And my reaction is this can't work. You can't change the physiology of your body. I know that one of the understandings of keto or one of the hopes with keto ages ago was you could train your body to do what we call fat adapt, but even in the very best athletes, they could not do that and maintain their best performance. I never assume that people understand that the energy system that they're trying to fuel runs on carbohydrate and you are a carbohydrate machine and that is what's going to get you through your event and you need those. They are your friend. Louise, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome.